So today the two techniques that we're going to go over are still ensemble or bulk spectroscopy techniques, um, but different from what we were doing in the last lecture with UV biz, we're going to be working in the infrared region and then also working with polarized light. And both of these methods, I would say, are uh, low resolution spectroscopic methods. So when I'm saying low resolution, this is talking about the structure of proteins or nucleic acids or other, I guess, smaller biomolecules. Um, and they're able to extract secondary structure and it's kind of a stretch with tertiary structure. Um, so we're not going to be getting atom resolutions like some of the techniques we'll talk about in the future like electron microscopy, like cryo-electron microscopy or x-ray. We're not going to be getting angstrom levels. We're going to get rough percentages of the amount of alpha helix, beta sheets, um, or paired up base pairs, um, and the like. So for IR spectroscopy, what we're going to go over for all instruments, we're going to go over the different components, the physics behind it, how it works. And we're also going to talk about which bonds does it probe in biomolecules. And I'm also going to briefly mention some of the more advanced techniques. So this would be like using attenuated total reflection or doing two-dimensional infrared spectroscopy or time resolve. So we'll discuss those briefly. And then for CD spectroscopy or circular dichroism spectroscopy, that's going to be um, a shorter part of the lecture. And again, what components of the instrument are there? Um, an important thing to take away with CD is unit conversion, understanding what the units mean uh, and how they're reported. So today for the instruments we're going to be talking about, the source is going to be IR light. These are still spectroscopy techniques or polarized light. Our samples are mostly going to be on the biomolecule, biopolymer side of things. Um, a little IR is sometimes used with cellular tissues, but not as frequently. And then the detectors here have to work in the infrared region. So these are more pyro pyroelectric detectors or photoconductors. or even they use the property that infrared light uh, produces heat. They can also use thermoelectric detectors as well. Uh, so jumping into infrared spectroscopy, um, do you guys remember from last lecture what the infrared range was that we defined? Either with the chat or speaking up. So we have multiple people answering the max being one millimeter wavelength and the lower end being at the edge of the visible region of 780 nanometers to one millimeter or so. Um, and then which electronic transition did it probe? Yeah, vibration. So that's what we're getting at with infrared. And I would say for biophysics application, this, uh, sorry. There we go. this is a full range for the IR. But for biophysics applications, you're mostly working in the mid IR range. So this is around 3 to 50 microns in wavelength. And traditionally, um, infrared spectroscopy is reported in terms of wave numbers. Um, so this mid-IR range would be, I guess we can roughly say 4,000 inverse centimeters to around 200 inverse centimeters. And they use wave numbers because um, it's linear. The wave number scale is linear or directly proportional to the energy or the frequency. So 
or the frequency of light. And I show here like a typical report of how IR results are shown. So more often than not, you'll see tr percent transmittance instead of absorbance versus the wave number here. So that's where you see that this looks like it's upside down. But with more specialized IR techniques or depending what people are measuring, sometimes they'll actually re report this as absorbance and you'll see the more typical upwards looking plot. Um, so pay attention when you're looking at IR uh, spectra of what the Y axis is. Um, and uh, these are also reported as wave number, not just because they're linear with energy or frequency, but also the units, if we use frequency, it would be something like 10 to the 14th or 10 to the 15th Hertz. Uh, so just the scale of those numbers uh, in the IR community, they find it more reasonable to use wave numbers as well. So remember that the conversion for wave numbers, the units are inverse centimeters. And this would be one over the wavelength, if you're reporting the wavelength in centimeters, if you're reporting the wavelength in microns, or nanometers, just make sure you use the correct conversion factor with that. Um, and then uh, if you're converting between frequency and units of Hertz, you would then have to uh, get the correct scale by using the speed of light, again, in units of centimeters per second, or taking the proper conversion between meters per second to centimeters per second. So always make sure you're doing your dimensional analysis correctly if you're trying to convert between these. Um, we talked about how this measure is vibrational states. And you can get at what the quantum levels are, what energy ranges this is probing um, uh, based on the classic harmonic oscillator and then also the quantum uh, harmonic oscillator. So these vibrational states is important in infrared spectroscopy that you're only gonna be able to measure um, uh, changes in a dipole moment. So if you have a symmetric molecule, you're not gonna be able to resolve and this is more typical of if you're doing small molecule infrared spectroscopy, let's say like carbon, like oxygen or nitrogen. If you have a homo uh, di diatomic molecule, there's no dipole change here. So, but if you have something like carbon monoxide, you'll be able to see that. With biomolecules, they're so large uh, and they have quite a bit of asymmetry. Um, you probably won't run into these type of problems of not having a dipole moment change. Um, and if we think of the classic harmonic oscillator, the vibrational frequency would be one over two pi um, times the square root of your force constant here of whatever your spring or your oscillator is over the reduced mass, which is the mu value here. And if we go to the quantum expression, for the energy between vibrations. Looks very similar to the classical one, where you have your quantum vibrational number So this is a quantized value here that we're going to use as V plus one half. That's times Planck's constant over two pi times the square root of, again, k over mu. So we can express this in terms of your quantum vibrational frequency, or your classical, quant your classical vibrational frequency. So we can just write this as the quantum vibrational number plus 1 half times Planck's constant times your vibrational frequency. So since we know that these quantized states are quantized, we can say our energy difference, if we're going from a ground vibrational state 
to an excited vibrational state. That's what, that's what happens when you're absorbing an infrared photon. We can then write this if we're saying our change in our vibrational state is equal to one. We can then write this as very simply as H times our vibrational frequency or H times that quantum number or delta V, sorry. The change in the quantum number, which then would be h over 2 pi times the square root of k over the reduced mass. So this is a very easy way to then, if you know what vibration you're looking at, you would just have to calculate what the reduced mass is, the rest of, and what k is. And then you can calculate what delta E would be. And that energy, you can then convert that to wave numbers. This um, would be 5.3 times 10 to the negative 12th square root of K over the reduced mass. So this is the equation you would use for a certain vibrational level that then you can get this in units of inverse centimeters here. So finding these values for K or for mu will depend on what atoms and what vibrations you're looking at. And it's not a complete lecture about infrared spectroscopy if I don't like dance with my hands, but this GIF is very nice on, um, on this slide to show different types of stretching. So if you're trying to calculate the wave numbers, let's say this is carbon and this guy is an oxygen, you would then calculate the reduced mass between those, get a value, a constant value for K, and you can calculate what the wave number would be here. So these are the different types of vibrations that infrared spectroscopy probes, um, and they show up at discrete different wave number peaks here. Um, so these animations are quite, realize that these are simplified, that IR spectra actually end up becoming quite complicated if you have symmetries. So if you have multiple of these vibrations taking place, those peaks are going to overlap and add together. You can act, you can have um, coupling or damping between, let's say there's a common Let's say there's a stretch here between this carbon and oxygen, but then this guy is also connected to another carbon, and there's a different vibration taking place here. So that can cause some dampening if there is a common um, atom in that vibration. Um, you can also have overlapping peaks if some of the vibrations have similar energies. Then you can also have harmonics. And harmonics are when you have a change in the quantum number that's higher than one, so two or three. Um, this is gonna be a multiple of uh, the, the frequency that you see for n times one for the quantized state here. Um, so with all of these complications, it's very difficult to take uh, an IR spectrum of a, of, of a biomolecule and assign every single peak and say this, this peak is exactly um, the amine uh, bending. Um, so it's different. Then if you've taken organic chemistry or in chemistry, if you're looking at small molecules, you can assign every single peak uh, to an exact vibration. Um, but with biomolecules, it's very difficult. So if you're taking an IR spectrum, 
just like we went over with UV Biz, I want to go over the different instrumental components. Um, that it, for the source, you're trying to produce IR light. And this is typically done by heating and producing black body, ra black body radiation. So typically you're heating, um, there's, you can heat platinum. Um, this is called a Nernst blower. Silicon carbide um, is called a glow bar. Um, Niochrome wire. Um, you can pass a current through um, mercury liquid. I don't know how commonly these are used now, um, but that will get you the far, far IR. Um, or you can use a tunable carbon dioxide laser. So these are common sources. And for the heating uh, black body radiation sources, you're heating these metals up to around 1300 to around 2000 Kelvin. So there's typically around your source, there's also some water for cooling the lamp. Uh, so with all of these different types of light sources, they're gonna have different spectral ranges. And it's also worth noting, this is for the Nernst blower here, that the spectrum is not going to be uniform. So if you're trying to measure things around two to 3,000 sorry, nanometers, like you'll have good intensity here, but as you move into uh, the far UV or far IR, like your intensity decreases. So this is where you might have to use the mercury arc lamp and, and the like. So understanding and uh, calibrating for these dips and in intensity, uh, be aware that your spectrum might, may not be uniform. Um, for the sample, for holding your sample, for the sample holders, um, having IR transparency is a challenge. Um, so unlike UV Viz, where we get to use glass and that's nice, glass absorbs in the IR. So typically special salt plate windows have to be used. So some common ones are calcium fluoride, zinc chloride, zinc selenium, barium fluoride. And over here I have an example uh, that people usually have to custom build their sample holders for biomolecules because you need to have, um, you can see here that they can flow a sample in and out. Um, with the solvents, it's difficult to have like um, uh, commercial, uh, commercial sample holders that can hold solvent. And with bio samples, you typically want to be measuring with solvent present. So people have to build their own. Um, mentioning solvent, um, you can't use water. Typically with IR measurements, this is the spectrum for water here. And you can see in the areas that we're interested in, Typically, we're looking at peaks between 3,000 and 1,500 wave numbers, um, uh, that there is absorbance, or there is, yeah, there is absorbance um, in this region, and especially greater than 3,000 wave numbers as well. And this is where you'll get some of the uh, specific details of the molecule. So you can't use water, so people typically use heavy water, so deuterated solvents. So um, hydrogen with an extra proton there. Um, and we'll get into some of the details that uh, there's special ways to have samples at an interface and only measure at the interface of your sample holder. And that's another way to get around not measuring the spectrum of water. Um, wavelength selectors, nothing special here. Typically, they're going to be gratings. Um, and for the detectors, 
finally, um, I mentioned that you can take advantage of heating. Um, I'd say the detectors are typically divided between pyroelectric detectors, where this is where you're going to have a dielectric sandwich between some metal, between electrodes. And this creates a temperature dependent capacitor. So as I, by our light heats, uh, this dielectric, it'll change the capacitance and you measure that change in capacitance um, with the temperature. Um, for photoconductors, this is where you're converting photons to electrons. Um, these are typically semiconductors with their band gap in the IR range. And these are typically mercury, cadmium telluride, super safe detector, nothing toxic about that, that's sarcasm. Um, indium antimony or lead sulfide. So not the uh, most green materials, I'd say. And then with heating, you can also use thermal transducers um, these are more on historic instruments. They're not used anymore um, since semiconductors are a lot cheaper now. Um, these are also prone to thermal noise. And these are simply going to be thermocouples um, or kilometers, or you have a change in current or voltage based on the temperature of the materials that you're using. So with all these different components, are there any questions about what you, what's inside the black box of the IR uh, instruments? Okay. Do pyroelectrics have the same thermal noise issues? So I think the energy, that's a good question. Um, so I would think that they may not be as sensitive as the thermal transducers, but yeah, I'll have to look into that in more detail. But I think uh, since it's going from photon to temperature change, um, the material that's being used for these is triglycerin sulfate. So I'd have to look at like how sensitive that is to just the thermal noise in the room, but I'm not sure about that. So I'll look into it in more detail. Let me note that. Yeah, just pointing out these same tables that we talked about in the last lecture and that are on um, on Canvas, you can see that we're focusing on the right-hand range here. So you can see the different salt plates that are used for IR spectroscopy, that this is kind of the range we're working in. Um, that gratings and interference filters will work, and then all the different lamps are shown here. Uh, along with the detectors. So you can see the difference compared to the UV viz that we discussed. It's completely different detectors um, and lamps to be able to work in that IR range. It's important to note that most infrared spectroscopy that's being done today is a Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy where we're using CASE's favorite instrument uh, component, the Michelson interferometer. Um, and we're using that to create an optical path difference. 
So we have our IR source here, if it's our glow bar, our NERNS glower, or the like, and we're passing it through. And then this is a beam splitter where for in the infrared region, it's gonna be uh, mylar coated plastic typically. Um, so it splits that beam 50-50. Uh, it's gonna send 50% of the light to this fixed mirror. It's gonna send 50% of the light to this moving mirror where the position can change. And the rate that we're changing that position will give us our resolution, which I'll go over. Um, that light is then reflected back uh, from these mirrors and it's recombined. It passes through the sample and goes to our detector here. Um, you'll note that this schematic for FTIR um, also has a helium neon laser and that is used as an, a separate detector over here and that's to calculate what is M. That's the control there. Um, so you're going to be um, creating this optical path length difference so you can collect your data in the frequency domain instead of the time domain. Um, so with this change in the path length, we're going to have this fixed distance here, F, and this M distance that's going to be changing. Um, and we're going to have, be able to calculate the retardation factor. So that's going to be lowercase delta, and that's going to be 2 times M minus F. So the two here is coming from the fact that it's going to the fixed mirror and then coming back. So it's two times this value and the same for M. And um, calculating this value will show you if you're going to be having constructive or destructive interference here. And if we want to know what our resolution capabilities are in the frequency domain, this is going to be one over this retardation factor here. Um, so the reason that most instruments are Fourier transform instead of time domain um, IR spectroscopy is based on the frequency of IR light. So if we were working at 10 to the 14 hertz or so in the time domain, this would be too fast of a change to detect. But if we change our resolution to something that's more in terms of um, wave numbers, FTIR spectroscopy can get down to resolutions of, um, of less than 0.1 cent inverse centimeters for the wave number. So this gives us much higher resolution. Um, so, I'd say things before the 1980s was mostly time domain IR. In the 1980s, we shifted to Fourier transform IR, but these were huge instruments and they were super expensive. They were around like 100K or so. And then since the 1980s, now FTIR is the same price. It fits on a bench top, and this is going to be the most routine infrared spectroscopy that you can uh, use. So it also helps with the detection limits um, and signal to noise ratios. And you take, just to point out that this is in the frequency domain here, and then you do a fast Fourier transform, and then it will be your time domain spectrum. So I would say also key in the 1980s would be like the computation it was also key. So you could do this fast Fourier transform easily on a desktop computer next to the instrument shown there. Um, so all the data that I'll be showing, that's gonna be with the FTIR and most biophysical papers that you read will be with FTIR. Um, I'd also like to mention a few other geometries or specializations with infrared spectroscopy that you may see, especially in the biophysics literature, that there is attenuated total internal reflection IR or ATR. And this is taking advantage of total internal reflection of your light. 
So if you have your lights, if this is normal to your sample, if you pass this at a high angle here, and the angle that you're, you're passing your light through your sample crystal here is greater than the critical angle based on some Snell's law, if you guys think back to your optics, um, you'll have most of the light reflected back. But there is a small amount of light after this reflection that passes through the sample, and that's what we call an evanescent wave. And this decays exponentially. And for IR light, it's gonna be uh, probably 500 nanometers or so. So you're looking selector, selector, selectively at the interface. So these are typically used for, if you want your sample, we'll talk about self-assembly of lipids. It's very good to use with and oils so that you can have a monolayer form at that interface. Or you can also have your proteins if they'll form and stick to the interface, you can selectively look at what the structure is there. Um, so this is a way where you can, since it is decaying exponentially with the distance, if I'm plotting here distance in Z versus that intensity, uh, it's a way to remove some of the effects of the solvent. So these are typically add-ons to infrared instruments. It'll be a nice large crystal that you use. Um, and uh, that's something to ask if you're gonna be trying to do IR spectroscopy. Um, another more specialized technique that you'll see in the literature um, possibly would be time-resolved uh, infrared spectroscopy. So you're changing something over time. And this is actually problem nine in uh, the problem set where um, in that problem they're doing a temperature jump or you could do stop flow where you're changing, you have a flow system and you can introduce a new solvent. People will do hydrogen deuterium exchange with this where they uh, want to see, let's say on a lipid membrane, they'll send in new lipids that have deuterium instead and they'll see those peaks change. Um, so this is how you get some time information. So time resolved could be something as fast as nanoseconds to hours, depending on what type of change that you're uh, introducing. Um, for multidimensional IR and if you're doing ultra fast, these are typically techniques that are doing pump probe. So you have two lasers come in, a laser that measures, at the start, then you have another photon come in some time later that's going to probe or cause some change. And then you can send in some time later another measurement uh, pulse. So here, this would be one measurement. This will be another measurement on the two axes and a traditional there's no time change that's gonna be on the diagonal here. But then you can get these different peaks that change with the time delay between those measurements and what probe you're doing to see how uh, different vibrations couple, how energy is exchanged and the like. So this is much more advanced. Um, this is an example for a protein. And you can see the time scales here um, uh, going from microseconds to milliseconds. And I would say if you're interested in like really advanced spectroscopy, these two-dimensional and multi-dimensional infrared spectroscopy is a cool technique. It's a somewhat complicated technique, but you can get a lot of information and a lot of details at the molecular scale. So people are looking at how uh, even just water is organized around um, proteins and biomolecules and the like. So it's a specialized field, but it's really cool. So if you're interested, in that area or infrared spectroscopy, I can point you to some uh, groups. And I would say they're really some of the best spectroscopy groups with crazy skills um, to be able to work at these ultra fast time scales, to be working in the infrared because working, setting up um, custom home built infrared spectroscopy, you can't see the lasers that you're aligning. So um, there's a lot of 
cool specialized um, optical building taking place there. Um, so I've pointed here for this data here. Um, Andre Tokomakov is at University of Chicago, and then Carlos Baez is uh, just started his group at University of Texas, and they're doing really cool stuff. Um, okay, so getting into let's talk about more of the biophysics and getting into the applications. And I've listed here biopolymers because that's really um, talking about if we're viewing proteins as a polymer of amino acids and the like um, nucleic acids as polymers of those nucleobases, um, that's the scale that it's typically used at, um, if you think back to chapter one. Um, so I mentioned that for biopolymers, biomolecules, it's in the mid IR range, is the typical vibrations that you're looking at. Um, and the absorption in this mid IR range is quite small. So the absorption is typically 0.05 to 0.1% change. Um, so because the absorption is so small, that's why FTIR is key here, that if you didn't have the FTIR, you wouldn't have that low detection limit to be able to see these small changes. Um, so on this slide, I wanna focus on proteins. And uh, that typical vibrations have to do with the, that are probed are the hydrogen bonding um, related to secondary structure. So this figure over here is from our first lecture, if you remember. Um, the beta sheets versus the alpha helices that you can see where these hydrogen bonds are forming across the amino acids uh, to form these different secondary structure components. Um, so you can discriminate between uh, beta sheet, alpha helix, a random coil in certain specific ranges. So um, the vibrational bands that are probed, they've been called arbitrarily amide one, which is C double bond O stretch and the CN stretch. So you can see the CO stretch here and the CN stretch in those amide bonds. So you can see an example spectrum here uh, where this amide one bond is pointed out. So, um, And then also amide two is then related to uh, the NH bend. So you can see NH and these amine groups shown there. So that's shown here. So typically in this range around 1500 to 1700 wave numbers, you can see that for amide one here, these peaks where the, they're located at will change based on if you have an alpha helix, a beta sheet disordered or the turn. So you'll see these guys move slightly uh, based on what that secondary structure is. Um, you also see here that there's like amide three noted or amide A or amide four. And those are typically like a combination of different percentages of four or five different stretches. So this is going back to when I was talking about uh, how complicated biomolecule spectra are. That's where it shows up here that you can start to see like these peaks are overlapping. Like this is 20% of a C CN WAG or something like that. Uh, so using the amide one and amide two peaks, you can get hypothetically a percentage of alpha helix and beta sheet structure and the like. Um, I would say more frequently with proteins, you're going to probe some change. Um, so let's say you add a denaturant or you add some ligand that looking at the relative change of spectra can give you more information. Okay. Um, so thinking about some of the other biomolecules, um, nucleic acids, 
These are typically probed with the C double bond O um, shifts with base pairing. So you can see some of the different peaks that will show up for nucleic acids um, that you can see different vibrations for um, the phospho chain, the sugar phosphates, um, the double bonds of the nucleobases and the sugar. So typically again in this area around 1600 uh, wave numbers is where you're going to be looking at changes with the base pairing. Um, uh, and those distances uh, will change um, that you can differentiate between the A, the B, and the Z forms of DNA. So uh, if you remember from the first lecture that the A form of the DNA is the most common, Z has an inverse chirality, um, the differences, and you can also identify different novel structures that we also mentioned that um, if they're taking a quadruplex um, or triplex structure. Um, so some of these DNA, nucleic acid, uh, I guess, biomolecule uh, machines and the like. Um, again, looking at changes in structure with ligand binding, if you were thinking of aptamers or single-stranded uh, DNA or RNA, that if you have some aptamer and then a ligand comes in and it closes up, you can detect those structural changes based on the strength of the vibrations in this area. Um, and also local environmental changes uh, with the structure, to the structure as well. So again, um, just like with the proteins, conformational changes can be measured with some perturbation with relative changes. Um, then moving on to lipids, um, you have a lot of signal from the CH fatty acids, but that's not as much of interest that you're looking for unique chain signals and uh, vibrations in the glycerol head. That's where the differences are. You can then fingerprint that's a term you'll see a lot in IR spectroscopy, fingerprinting different lipids. So over here is an example for different um, types of lipids where you can see here, this is phosphoglycine, um, phosphocholine. So these are gonna all have different uh, glycerol heads and you can see that the spectra, um, there's some peaks in common, but there are some uh, distinct peaks between them. So. That's where this fingerprinting comes in. What's the unique spectrum that's uh, taking place? Um, people use this to study phase changes. As I mentioned that in the first lecture that you can go from a gel phase to, uh, let's see, temperature of gel or a liquid phase. So as you introduce different lipids, um, uh, what, what is the phase? And then also, um, as I mentioned with ATR, this is commonly used with lipids since they'll form a self-assembled uh, layer at that interface or a bilayer. So it's very nice to do interfacial studies with lipids in ATR. And then finally, use less commonly cells, tissues, and biofluids. They have really complex spectra. And I would say uh, fingerprinting is commonly used here, where you have to use um, principal component analysis. To try to group or find uh, different information in a lot of data or doing like machine learning applications to try to see if you can identify different tissues or cell types. So you can see here in this spectrum, you can see there's a gap in the x-axis here. Um, but you can see these are very different tissues. You have brain, 
you have bacteria, you have synovial fluid, and these spectra look quite similar because of the extreme complexity uh, within them. Uh, so that's why I would say just simple human identification would be very difficult with this and is why you have to use these more advanced computational techniques to try to see can you resolve something or not. Okay. And the last thing I want to mention with IR spectroscopy is some of the, um, if you are trying to use IR spectroscopy or actually use it or find one on campus, um, that uh, the instrumentation is, I would say, similar to UV, that most vendors, there's a lot of vendors, most vendors, Thermo Fisher, um, Shim Shimadzu, uh, Jasco, but there's many vendors for FTIR, and I would say it's more, uh, it's definitely a benchtop instrument where this is even an older model and you can see the scale here. Um, just like UV biz, you can have single beam or double beam setups where the double beam has nicer controls uh, for any noise, environmental noise and the like. And the prices for these typically run 15 to $25,000 or so. And it will depend on what your wavelength range is. Um, if you wanna be working from the far IR to the visible range, that's gonna be your more expensive instruments. Um, also has to do with the uh, resolution that you want as well. Higher resolution is going to be more expensive. Um, so yeah, I would say that there are IR viz instruments as well. Um, so uh, and those typically have, I would say, like three separate light sources and the like. Um, it's worth noting that quantitative work is a challenge. Um, that you need to be done, it needs to be done carefully. That with UV Viz, we are calculating all those concentrations and like, it's very difficult to apply Beer's Law to IR spectroscopy. Um, and that's because you have those overlapping peaks um, and all those complications that I mentioned of coupling and the like that can, that they don't scale linearly with concentration. Um, with concentration. Um, and an important thing is that the sample cell path lengths are not well known. Um, and this is because they're based on salts, They'll corrode um, and dissolve uh, with water vapor. Um, so your path length is likely gonna change over time. If you've ever used these salt plates, they chip easily too. So it's hard to use Beer's Law because of concentration and the path length errors here. Um, it's also important to know with IR spectroscopy, since water has um, a large signature, you have to purge out the water vapor that lots of times there's a nitron, nitrogen atmosphere, argon atmosphere, or you have to do post-processing with an appropriate control to remove those peaks. Um, and finally, it's important to remember that if you're doing ATR or if you're measuring with different solvents, how does the state of your sample affect your measurement? Um, are you trying to do a measurement of a solid or an interface or D2O? That's gonna change from your native sample. Where I'm saying native, meaning like in water buffer, or like your cytosol fluid, that this is gonna be perturbed by how you're preparing your sample because the sample has to work in the infrared region. Um, so those are important things to note. Um, so that's most of what I wanted to cover with infrared spectroscopy. Um, are there any questions or, I don't, I'll be honest, I don't use IR spectroscopy that much. So if any of you guys do and you have other practical uses or tips or tricks that you wanna mention. Um,
feel free to note them. Take some time in the chat. <clears throat> Okay, so I'll move on to CD spectroscopy. I just have a couple slides on this. Um, but you'll often see CD spectroscopy used in combination with IR spectroscopy as well, since they both give secondary structure information for molecules. Um, and this takes advantage of the fact that almost all biomolecules chiral, where a reminder of chirality, meaning that if you take the mirror reflection of this molecule, that you can never overlay them. Um, so similar to your hands, that they're mirror objects, but you can't get them to align up. Um, so we mentioned in the first lecture that most amino acids are going to be the L configuration, most sugars are going to be the D configuration, and you'll also hear chirality referred to as birefringent. meaning that it absorbs, it, uh, with different circularly polarized lights, it allows one to pass through better than the other. Um, or you'll also hear it being referred to as they're all optically active. Um, so this optically active or birefringent is talking about the fact that uh, biomolecules absorb left and right-handed light differently. So circularly polarized light, the absorption of the left-handed circularly polarized light versus the right-handed circularly polarized light um, it doesn't equal zero. And this is, if we plug it into uh, Beer's law, what this means is that the molecular extinction coefficient for left and right-handed light is different. This is what we're probing, is this difference. Um, so traditionally, um, CD spectroscopy, it measures this difference in absorbance, but then it's converted um, to something called molar ellipticity, which we'll refer to as theta. And this is all for historical reasons. And the conversion between molar ellipticity um, and absorbance is just this weird constant value, 3,289, or sorry, 3,298.2 times your absorbance over your path length and concentration. That's times your difference in absorptivity. And I'm not gonna go into the derivation, but where this constant comes from is going from like radians to degrees. It also has to do with like a Taylor expansion um, for an approximation and the like, so that's where you get this constant value uh, here. Um, so the components for a circular dichroism spectroscopy instrument is your light source. Let me draw a light bulb really bad. It's going to be a xenon arc lamp. And what comes out of that is it's going to be light, it's going to be white light, and it's going to be unpolarized. But we want to measure this, the difference of absorbing circularly polarized light. So what we have to do here is we have a monochromator to select the wavelength. And then we also have a linear, polar, linear uh, polarizer. So that will convert your light to, that's a horrible wave, my goodness. Um, linear polarized light at a single wavelength is what's coming out of here. Then there's a special piece of equipment in CD 
instruments and it's going to be a piece of uh, quartz. So this is going to be our quartz. I'll just write Q. It's connected to some electrodes and a metal and you can pass uh, current through here or you can pass a voltage through here and based on the piezo properties of the quartz um, you can change single wave or linearly polarized light to single or to circularly polarized light and control it. So the important thing here and why this is connected to um, electrical current is you want to be able to switch between right and left. And this specialized piece of equipment is called a photoelastic modulator. Or PEM. So what comes out of here is you're going to have right-handed light and left-handed polarized light. Um, and you're able to modulate between those. Then you have your sample that's optically active and this is going to be in a quartz cuvette because the ranges that we're measuring here is going to be in the UV region. So the quartz makes it compatible with the UV. And coming out after this light interacts with your sample is it's going to interact differently with the right-handed lights and then let's say it absorbs more of the left-handed right light here. And then finally, your detector, it's typically a photomultiplier too, um, because we are looking at small differences in the absorbance between these two. So to photomultiplier tube, you have your light, it goes to an electron, and then you have a series of multipliers for those electrons to be multiplied. Um, so this has a high gain. That's the importance of using the photomultiplier tube in, um, in circular dichroism instruments. Um, so those are the components for the, for the instrument. Um, CDs typically used just for proteins and nucleic acids. And similar to how we were talking about this, the UV vis, this is in the UV vis region. Um, so for proteins, or it's in the UV region, for proteins, it's typically probed in the far UV. You can see down here from about 190 nanometers to 250, and that's going to give you secondary structure information. So this plot here shows some typical uh, signature peak styles for different secondary structures, and this is why it's used in in, uh, in congruence with the infrared spectroscopy. Um, so you can see here that a signature for the alpha helix is typically very strong. You have a high peak in the very far UV near 190, and then there's typically peaks around 222 and 208 or so is a signature of alpha helix. While with beta sheet, you can see that there's a peak more around 200 that's positive and more around, I guess, like 217 or 218. So those are the peaks that you're typically looking for. While um, a denatured or random coil, you can see in light blue um, or this extended structure that if you have a random coil um, or denatured, there's not as clear peaks that you're observing. Um, you can also use the near UV, where again it interacts with tyrosine and tryptophan and uh, cysteine. Sorry, cysteine, just like when we were talking about in UV vis. Um, and that can give you a little bit of information about the tertiary structure, but it is complicated to actually get exact, like you're not going to get molecular positions there. You're, here you're looking more for like relative changes in the tertiary structure. Um, for nucleic acids, this is related to the pi pi stacking of the base pairs. Um, and this is usually from 200 to 300 nanometers 
and it can tell the difference between, again, this A form of the DNA, the B form, or if it's a mixture and the like. So that's what this plot is showing here. Um, it's worth noting when you're measuring these biomolecules, you don't use just molar ellipticity. You have to convert molar ellipticity to, or you have to convert, sorry. You have to convert molar ellipticity to mean residue or base pair ellipticity. This is the fact that this is a polymer, and you have to normalize this uh, for the number of amino acids or the number of um, base pairs. And this is relative to, to have this concentration and if you're comparing different proteins and the like. Um, so with these spectral signatures here um, for proteins, I have an example of some CD spectra that I actually took during my postdoc. And with the different colors here, if you guys can indicate in the chat which one would be um, the alpha, which one's the beta, which one would be the mixed protein, if you looked at this spectra. Wait, I'm Professor Kisley. Yeah. Quick question. Um, in the previous slide, what did AA stand for again? Amino acid. Oh, amino acid. Yeah. And then BP is base pair. So just some shorthand there. Yeah. Or also, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. Okay. And another question is um, from Andy is the uh, Would this be for the, can you clarify with your question? The P, P yeah, rotating as a quarter wave plate? Yeah. Instead of this modulator, is it just a quarter wave plate, basically? Or, I mean, same idea? Yeah, it's a similar idea to the quarter wave plate. So an alternative to using this photoelastic modulator would be a way to switch a quarter wave plate or rotate it very quickly to switch between right and left-handed polarizations. Um, but instead, like the PEM is just uh, a way to do that much quicker. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I think Rose said, let me go back to the chat. That blue is alpha. So yeah, that's correct. So this has a nice peak set 222. It should be around 208 or so. Um, and which one would be beta? So Rose mentioned green. So this one, it has very and let's see, Dushani has red as beta. Yeah, so here, the WW, this orange curve, would be the beta structure. So it has a stronger positive peak over here. Um, if we go back to, so this is anti-parallel beta. So I guess I need, I should have had a nice parallel beta sheet I need to add to this. Um, so this is actually parallel beta. So I'll add that to Canvas. Let me make a note. And then by pro process of elimination, then you can say that the green would be both. Um, I would say if I didn't know anything about this protein and I had just had that spectra, I would say that it would be alpha. Helix, but um, it depends on the percentages. And with these proteins, we knew what their structure was. Um, this was just confirming that they had the expected structure. So these are the ribbon diagrams for these proteins. So you can see this lambda 1, 2 is all alpha helix. And we have this in the table here. It's 71% and 0% of the random coil. The beta has 34% beta and the 
PGK, the green, has a mixture. So I did want to show this because the mixture you could possibly deconvolve from a CD spectra what that percentage is. But you can see it can start to get complicated. So this is again why infrared and CD spectroscopy are used in combination together because both of them aren't the most clear exact techniques. So they're typically used in combination. Um, and then finally, I want to get into uh, quickly before the end of some tips and tricks with CD spectrometers. Um, I would say it's more specialized. There's only a couple of vendors. You typically only see JASCO or Aviv as the vendors. And every single campus that I've worked on, there's only like one or two around. And it's typically, you can find it in shared equipment, but it's typically housed in one lab. So here at Case, um, in the protein expression, it has a really, I think this is the acronym for the, it's a protein expression and characterize, characterization facility. And that's in the biophysics department in the med school. This is in a specific lab and they have an Aviv instrument. And then over at the Cleveland Clinic in the Learner Research Institute, they have a JASCO CV. So you really have to like seek them out. Um, uh, with the setup of the instrument, this is a typical JASCO instrument. You can see that there's some gas being fed in and there's always, it's always going to be connected to a liquid nitrogen gas tank and you feed in nitrogen gas because the xenon arc lamp, it can produce ozone and ozone absorbs UV light. So if you want to be able to do your measurement, you have to make sure that you purge that uh, with nitrogen. Um, you can also see here, this is a water cooler um, and there's typically a um, Petlier device that if you want to change the temperature, um, these guys here are for injecting solutions. So you can do, again, like a stop flow experiment and these are all add-ons. So if you want to see how your protein secondary structure is changing with the addition of a ligand or with temperature. Uh, there's typically those additions, but you have to make sure if you're picking an instrument, do they have those additions? Um, I would say uh, for protein structure with the alpha helix, there's that nice peak at 190 nanometers, but you have to be have very nice cubes to be able to measure 190 nanometers. So you can even see in this slide over here, I actually cut it off because in 190, it started to go all crazy because I didn't have a nice cube. So um, people will be like, oh yeah, you just measured a 190 and it's, you have to be careful with that. Um, and then the last thing I just want to mention is um, every single CD, I typically use JASCO instruments and Every single one of them in this lid that's right here, you load your sample into the instrument, you close this lid, and the lid never stays shut and light gets in. Uh, so I don't know why, they've never really fixed that, but every single JASCO instrument I've used, there's always a huge pile of books next to it that you put on top. So that's just, um, you might run into those issues with not just CD, but other instruments as well. Um, so that's why I wanted to cover today with CD. Any questions with either instrument right now? Add it to the chat if you want. Um, if you want more info about infrared spectrometry, uh, chapter 16 I'll point you to. The Lemke Biophysics Tools book has a very brief, brief section on polarized spectroscopy. Um, and then I've added a combined PDF of different uh, sections on IR and CD from this encyclopedia on Canvas as well, if you guys want to find more details with that. Um, so that's what I had, and let me know if there's any questions or questions with the problem and set, set and stuff.